Welcome to Renolda Church. We are so glad you're here. Take just a moment to fill out the Connect card you received when you arrived and let us know how we can pray for you and your loved ones this week. We have a big team of prayer warriors here at Renolda, and we believe in the power of prayer, especially as a praying church family. Well, friends, we have already begun preparing for Easter here at Renolda Church. We are preparing to celebrate Jesus and his victory over sin and death when he rose from the grave. This year, we are excited to announce the launch of what we are calling the Path to Easter, a Lenten study. We'll be gathering in groups, posting fresh, exciting content every day, and so much more. From March 14th to April 15th, participants will receive a daily scripture reading and other great content. The passages selected will help your journey from Gethsemane's betrayal to the empty tomb with relevant connections to the wider story of the Bible. If you are interested in getting the most out of our resurrection celebration, this is a great opportunity for you. Learn more and register for groups, explore Easter service times, and connect to everything else Easter related using the link below. Again, we are so glad you're here. Welcome, let's worship the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords together. Hey, Renolda family, Pastor Chris here. I have some exciting news and an exciting journey to invite you into this Easter season. You know, Easter is one of the rare times in the history of our world that the attention of the whole world is pointed towards the Christian story of what Jesus has done for us. So this Easter, we're inviting you to join something we're calling the Path to Easter. It's a way for you to engage more deeply with the Holy Week story of what happened to our Jesus as it is presented across all the Gospels. I'm joined today by our Director of Women's Ministry, Ashley Johnson. How are you, Ashley? I'm good. So I'm very excited about some of the ways in which we have for people to engage with the Easter story this year. In particular, there are three ways that people can get connected. Yes, the first one is we want you to know that we've written a study guide to go along with daily readings all throughout the five weeks leading up to Easter. So as Chris said, you'll be taking a look across all four gospels of the passion and resurrection narratives, just five questions a day to help you dig deeper into those. We'll have these study guides printed and available at your campus in early March, so be looking for those. You also if you're signed up for our emails, we'll receive a daily email during these 25 days of study that includes a video from one of our members of the Ronaldo family talking about what that passage um, meant to them. You will receive audio versions of the passage and also an electronic version of the study guide. So if you're not signed up for our emails, this is a tremendous time to scan that QR code on your Connect card and give us your email address. But lastly, and maybe we're, we're most excited about this option, we are starting starting new groups at all of our campuses for you to join and then come together and discuss this content uh, during the season leading up to Easter, this Lenten season. So we would love for you to do that. We've got some groups just for women, some groups just for men, and some co-ed groups for folks of all ages. So please uh, talk to your campus pastor about those opportunities. So we want you to be in a group just for those five weeks, whether you've been in a group before or you're just like, I've never been in a group and this might be the right season. Get connected to the content get connected to God's people. You know, one of the things about Easter that I've become mindful of as we've looked at this text together as a staff is that Jesus' attention was always directed towards Jerusalem. Wherever he was, whatever he was doing, he was headed to Jerusalem so the Holy Week could happen for us. We're excited about inviting you on this path to Easter as we examine the ways in which the gospel reveals Jesus to us so that we can share Jesus with the world. I hope you'll go to renoldachurch.org forward slash Easter, sign up, get engaged with the content, and learn together with all of us. God bless you, Renolda Church.
I want to first say welcome to everybody at our campuses. Uh, wow, it's so good to be with you, especially if you're new with us. Uh, welcome. And to everyone joining online, especially if you're checking us out for the first time, uh, really, really honored to be with you today. And I uh, always like to remind you when I ask this question, whether you're live and in person or whether you're joining us by video, it demands an answer out loud like you mean it. Are you ready for some good news? Jesus didn't come just to take away your sin. He came to give you his righteousness. He came to take away your sin and to give you his righteousness. And that extraordinary truth changes everything. That truth is here in Jeremiah chapter 23, spoken some 600 years before Jesus came. Jeremiah chapter 23, part of our series on Jeremiah called Remade. I start reading at verse 1. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away and you've not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them, and I'll bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. And I will set shepherds over them. This idea of shepherds is the, is the, is the image for the king. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall fear no more, nor be dismayed. Neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. For behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved, Judah, the southern kingdom, and Israel will dwell securely, Israel, the northern kingdom. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt, speaking of the Exodus, but they'll say, as the Lord lives, who brought up and led the offspring of the house of Israel out of the north country and out of all the countries where he had driven them, and then they shall dwell in their own land. It's really, you know, it's so weird to try to explain something I was like being a minister, you know, because on one hand, I know I'm just so ordinary. And yet people, just because you're a minister, they, I don't know, they sometimes think you're more holy or something. And one of the things that happens a lot is that people uh, will, will act like if anything good happens in my life, you know, people act like, well, that's because, you know, you're, you're a minister and you've got that, you know, little extra favor from God, you know, kind of like, like you, you're on the good side of the big guy in the sky. I mean, if people would kind of like that at one time, I remember years ago, I was playing golf. I hit a golf shot so badly that it went sailing over the woods and hit the top of a, hit the roof of a house real hard. And uh, first thing, I was just glad I didn't put out a window. Hit the roof real hard. You could hear it. And then all of a sudden, you just saw it's like in slow motion. The ball came back over the trees, moving forward a little bit and right into the middle of the fairway. Just perfect. And uh, the guys I'm playing with, you know, they're like, oh, man, that's not fair. I guess that's what you get for all that right living. And I'm just laughing, kind of like, yeah, you know, and uh and, and, and then later, you know, and around, I hit another ball into the woods and it just goes and stays in the woods. And I'm like, what about all that right living now? And the irony of all of this is that I want to really actually say, if you only knew, the fact is I'm the righteousness of Christ himself. I want to talk to you about one of the dearest and most beautiful and powerful and transformational truths of the gospel that I, I honestly have a hard time really totally believing it because it's so good. And that is what theologians call the imputed righteousness of Christ. 
what it means for the Lord himself to be our righteousness. So uh, let's start with this text, the great problem that is here. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture. Verse 1, the people have had bad kings is what this is saying. And because of it, they are lost, they are scattered, they will be exiled. And what we get preceding our chapter is a litany of the bad kings that have preceded. And essentially what happened was there was a good king, Josiah, and then he was followed by four bad kings. And in Jeremiah 22, well, we'll look at, it, at this very quickly. Um, speaking of uh, the son of Josiah, Shalom, or he's also known as Jehoahaz, Woe to him, this is verse 13 of 22, woe to him who builds his house by unrighteousness and his upper rooms by injustice, who makes his neighbor serve him for nothing and does not give him his wages, who says, I will build myself a great house with spacious upper rooms, who cuts out windows for it, paneling it with cedar and painting it with vermilion. Do you think you're a king because you compete in cedar? Did not your father eat and drink and do justice and righteousness? So that's the rebuke of, of Jehoahaz. And then another son of Josiah followed, Jehoiakim. And this is what the prophecy of Jeremiah has to say about Jehoiakim's reign. Verse 21 of chapter 22, I spoke to you in your prosperity, but you said I will not listen. And this has been your way from your youth, that you have not obeyed my voice. And then the third in this legacy, the son of Jehoiakim, who is also called Coniah or Jehoiakim. Jeremiah twenty two twenty nine is the rebuke. O land, 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 hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord, write this man speaking of Jehoiakim, write this man down as childless, a man who shall not succeed in his days, for none of his offspring shall succeed in sitting on the throne of David and ruling again in Judah. Those three kings, one bad king after the other. And then there is a final king who is not mentioned by name, but he's most certainly in this text. In fact, as we will see, it is the most important image of a bad king for our text today, and it'll all make sense to you in the end, and that is Zedekiah, who was an uncle of Coniah, and Zedekiah reigned for 11 years until 586 BC when the Babylonians captured Jerusalem. And what's important to know is that Zedekiah was the last king on earth of the people of God. And there has not been another king in Israel. Then we're told, after all these bad kings, three of them mentioned, and then one who's most certainly implied in this text, as we'll see, we're told in verse 5 of Jeremiah 23 about a new king. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I'll raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In 2 Samuel chapter 7, David was promised that someone of his legacy, his family, would forever be on the throne, forever. And all of these bad kings that had come along and suddenly this image prophetically comes up of a righteous branch. And it has the image of a shoot that comes off of the stump of a tree. And this became in the ancient world a term that was used to describe the rightful heir to a throne. There will be a rightful heir to the throne of David, like a righteous shoot, like a branch. And he's going to reign as king, and here's what he's going to do. He's going to execute justice and righteousness. And I want to show you these words, two of the most important words in the Old Testament, mishpat, this is Hebrew, mishpat, which means justice, and tzedakah, 
which means righteousness. Mishpat and Tzedakah. This is something everybody that studies the Old Testament needs to know. Mishpat and Tzedakah. Justice and righteousness is the way we translate that, although these giant covenantal concepts carry more nuance than that. These two terms, justice and tzedakah, justice meaning that really that wrong is punished, that there's justice, that there's a judge who oversees all of this, and tzedakah, which has the sense of being righteous in terms of being benevolent and helping people and being kind, all that's part of tzedakah. And so over and over in the Old Testament, you see these two words together, like Amos 5, 24, let justice roll down like waters, let mishpat roll down like waters, and let righteousness, tzedakah, like an ever-flowing stream. Or in Psalm 33, 5, he loves tzedakah, righteousness, and mishpat, justice. The earth is full of the steadfast love of the Lord. Now, the reason I'm showing you all that is because even though his name, Zedekiah, that fourth bad king, the last king to ever reign on the earth of Israel, that that king, Zedekiah, his name comes from this word for righteousness, Zedekiah. Uh, So Zedekiah comes from Zedek and Yah, which is short for Yahweh, Jehovah, God, the name of God, Yahweh. So Zedekiah was not righteous, but his name means the Lord is righteous. We are not righteous, the Lord is righteous. That's where this all starts. And the move of this prophetic text that I want you to be fascinated by and then become enthralled with this, it is a move in this prophecy from Zedekiah, the Lord is righteous, who was a bad king, But the Lord is righteous, and it's a move towards the king who is coming. This is a prophecy of the Messiah in coming days who would be called the Lord is our righteousness. Everything wonderful and powerful and glorious about the gospel depends upon this movement from knowing the Lord as the righteous one to this great truth that every believer in Jesus Christ becomes clothed with the righteousness of God. So our life in Christ is a move from knowing simply that God is righteous and we're sinners to accepting his grace by his shed blood so that the Lord himself becomes our righteousness. Then comes in our prophecy today a great promise So there was a great problem, and now there's a great promise. There were bad shepherds, but the Lord says, I'm going to restore. Look again at verse 3. I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I've driven them. This is speaking of exile will end, and I will bring you back. And I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. Though you will spend time disciplined by the Lord as exiles. That's not the end of the story. The end of the story is something beautiful. It is restorative. And it ends with you being more fruitful than you ever imagined. And verse 5, the days are coming, declares the Lord. I raise up David, this righteous branch, and he shall dwell, as we've seen, with Mishpat and Sedekah. So the new Good shepherd, this king that is being prophesied will not scatter as the bad kings have, but will gather. He will not cause the sheep to be lost and afraid, but he will cause them to be found and to fear no more. We're talking about one of the most beautiful prophecies ever uttered. If all you know is that the Lord is righteous and you know you're a sinner, then you know you have distance from God, your soul is scattered, your life is burdened, and like a sheep with no real shepherd, you live afraid. And God has made a great promise. That verse 6, in his days, Judah will be saved, the southern kingdom. Israel will dwell securely 
All of God's people is being, are being talked about. And this is the name by which you'll be called. The Lord is our righteousness. Now here we are. The last king of God's people who was ever known on the earth was named Zedekiah, whose name means Yahweh is Zedek. The Lord is righteous. But the coming king for God's people will be called Yahweh is our Zedek. The Lord is our righteousness. So here comes a great praise that after such a promise, something unimaginably wonderful is taking place such that the people of God will be so enamored and enthralled by the wonder of this that it would actually become something that would dominate their thoughts even more than the exodus. This is what we read at verse 7 and 8. Here they are again. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when they shall no longer say, as the Lord lives, who brought up the people of Israel out of the land of Egypt. You remember the story. They were slaves, and God sent Moses to be a deliverer. And through a Passover lamb in every Hebrew home that was slain, and they put the blood over their doorposts, by that blood, the destroyer did not enter into those homes, and they were saved. So the story of the Exodus is a story of people who were in bondage, but who are set free by the blood of the lamb. And that story occupies so much of the heart and the mentality of the Jewish people and all throughout the pages of the Old Covenant. But what Jeremiah is prophesying is that there will be a day that there's going to be something even more wonderful than being saved by the blood of the Lamb that people are going to be talking about. And it has to do with the restoration of righteousness and fruitfulness and increase in our lives. Wow. So in summary of this, what I'm saying is that Jeremiah has prophesied in Jeremiah 23 after the prophecies that had rebuked all those bad kings, that there have been bad kings, and because the lives of the people were so tied up with their king, that when the king was bad, the people felt the consequences of it and were scattered, and they were exiled, and they were afraid, and they were lost, and they were without hope. But God promised a new king, in the line of David, who is a righteous branch, who would come and because of him, the people would be regathered and made unafraid. And this new king's work of regathering the people, restoring them and serving them in righteousness means that the new king's righteousness has become their righteousness. And this news is so wonderful that it actually eclipses even the glorious memory of the Passover wherein people were saved by the blood of the Lamb. It's just glorious. So... There is this great problem, bad kings. There's this great promise. A new king is coming. And there is this great praise that there's something wonderful that has taken place. And this is about the provision. The thing that we needed from God. And that we could have never attained for ourselves. And that which is so glorious and so wonderful that it... It can occupy your heart and fill you with wonder and change everything in your life. And that is to believe that the Lord, Jesus Christ, has become our righteousness. And theologians call this imputed righteousness. It's everywhere in the New Testament. Romans 3.21 now, the righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law. Although the law and the prophets bear witness to it, the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. Righteousness for the believer is appropriated by faith that believes that God has done this. Romans 4, 5. And to the one who does not work, talking about works of righteousness, legalism, 
but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Through faith, not faith as a work, like you're doing something that impresses God, but faith is the vehicle that appropriates, that takes God at his word, that has revelation and believes that this is true. That faith becomes counted to us by God as righteousness. 1 Corinthians 1.30 And because of him you are in Christ Jesus who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. He is our wisdom. He is our righteousness. Philippians 3.8 Paul said, indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith. Romans 5, 17. For if because of one man's trespass, that's Adam who sinned, death reigned through that one man, Adam, much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. So, one of the uh, uh, most articulate and beloved Reformed theologians of our day, Wayne Grudem, says this, if God merely declared us to be forgiven from our past sins, that would not solve our problems entirely. For it would only make us morally neutral before God. We would be in the state that Adam was in before he'd done anything right or wrong in God's sight. He was not guilty before God, but neither had he earned a record of righteousness before God. So God has done for us something that just bends my mind and puts us into a position that is worthy of praising him for all eternity. The human condition after Adam's sin is that we were all born sinners. And you say, well, it's not fair. That because of this one person, then we're all just born in that. But you can say, in this sense, Adam's sin was imputed to all of humanity. Became part of us. That's the human condition. But God, in his infinite love, came to change the human condition by this unimaginable gift that he would become our sin. So Adam's sin was imputed to every human. But Christ came so that anyone who trusts in him would have his or her sin imputed to Christ. When we say this theological term, imputed, what we mean is that God looks upon it as if. It is as if, when you believe, it is as if. Christ had committed your sin and mine. 2 Corinthians 5, 21. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So Adam's sin was imputed to humanity, and Christ came as a second Adam, so that all of that could be reversed for anyone who trusts in him, that your sin is imputed to Christ. And God looks upon Jesus as if he were responsible for everything wrong in your life. And when you wonder about the torture of the cross, and you wonder why he cried out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And you wonder about the agony of soul that he felt in Gethsemane as he clawed the ground and literally sweat blood. You need to understand this. Your sin was imputed to Christ. 
that every single wrong thought that I've ever had, anything that I've ever done that was unholy, every bit of it, the small and the big sin, all of it was put literally into Christ's being and God the Father in that moment in the cross, he looked upon his own beloved sin as if he had committed every sin in the past, the present, and the future of every person in the world. But there's a third form of imputation. And that is when you trust in Christ and you allow the reality of what this sinless man did as the Son of God and the Son of Man to be a human representative, a new Adam for you, to allow him to serve you in this way, to allow him to wash you in this way, to allow the God of the universe to humble himself and take on the form of a servant and be obedient even to death on a cross, and you allow him to serve you in this way by dying in your place, when you allow him to do that through simple childlike faith, and you say yes to that in your heart, yes to that with your mouth, another miracle takes place. And that is that not only does God look upon Jesus as if he had committed every one of your sins, but God looks upon you as if you had lived the perfectly meritorious life that Jesus lived. You in Christ are not made morally neutral. You are credited with his own righteousness. Which means that God is just in giving you heaven. And it changes everything in your life if you believe it. We don't just have a clean slate, though that is glorious. We have been granted every spiritual blessing in Christ because though it staggers my imagination... God looks upon you and me as if we had been as perfectly obedient as Christ himself. And that makes me weep for joy. Charles Spurgeon has preached on this text and I wept as I read his sermon. There was a part of me that said, don't preach, Alan, just get up and read his sermon. I have several references from it, starting with this. God considers us as though we were Christ. Looks upon us as though his life had been our life. And accepts, blesses, and rewards us as though all that he did had been done by us, his believing people. There are so many people, and I was one of them, who began the Christian life with the wondrous news that Jesus died for our sins. And we have spoken much and reveled much in the blood of Jesus that sets us free from the captivity and bondage of that sin and no longer is the penalty due us held over us who are in Christ. And that is wonderful. But I continue with Spurgeon, who preached, I find that many young Christians who are very clear about being saved by the merits of Christ's death do not seem to understand the merits of his life. Remember, young believers, that from the first moment when Christ did lie in the cradle until the time when he ascended up on high, he was at work for his people. And from the moment when he was seen in Mary's arms till the instant when in the arms of death he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, he was at work for your salvation and mine. He completed the work of obedience in his life and said to his father, I have finished the work which thou gavest me to do. Then he completed the work of atonement in his death 
and knowing that all things were accomplished, he cried, it is finished. He was through his life spinning the web for making the royal garment. And in his death, he dipped that garment in his blood. In his life, he was gathering together the precious gold. In his death, he hammered it out to make for us a garment which is of wrought gold. You have as much to thank Christ for loving as for dying. And you should be as reverently and devoutly grateful for his spotless life as for his terrible and fearful death. The text speaking of Christ, the son of David, the branch out of the root of Jesse, the Lord, our righteousness. It's not just in his dying for you, it's in his living for you. It's in every person he loved perfectly. It's in every leper that he approached and touched and healed. It is in every expression of kindness where he fed the mouths of the poor. It is in every gesture of mercy in which he had compassion upon the sinner. It is in every look of kindness in his eyes. It is in his never-ending patience and his steadfast love. It is in the life of Christ. It is in the love of Christ and all that he did that was perfectly obedient. It is in that also that we glory for. All of it has been credited to you, believer in Jesus. Wow. And I don't know why it is harder for me to really believe this, this imputed righteousness, than it is to believe that he has forgiven me. Perhaps it is because of the loneliness of a little boy who was never quite sure in fourth grade why his daddy left. Or maybe the seeds of shame that made that little boy feel like he always needed to be good, always needed to make A's, always win the tennis match, always win others' approval, that maybe that's why it seems more marvelous and amazing and unbelievable to me that Jesus' righteousness could be my own. That everything that I ever longed for, or worked for, or worried about and wondered about is answered deliciously in this Jehovah Sedekah. The Lord is my righteousness. And it means that Christian, you need not ever worry if your sin has damned you. Jesus paid that penalty. But it also means that you need not ever worry whether you've done enough for God to show you favor. We have come into a new covenant of which Jeremiah prophesied. We have come into the restoration of righteousness. We have come into the day of which he spoke in which we would have a new shepherd that would not scatter but would gather. A new shepherd who would be so perfect that in him we would fear not nor be dismayed. A perfect love has come to cast out our fear. Rejoice, child of God. The Lord is your righteousness. And note this well at verse 6. What Jeremiah prophesies is that this is the name, Yahweh, Sedekanu, the Lord is our righteousness. This name by which he will be called, the Lord is our righteousness. We call him so. This is our proclamation. And this is daring and wonderful and freeing and transforming and healing and empowering if you can do it and believe what God has said 
and what he's accomplished, that the Lord is your righteousness so that you can say, I have become the righteousness of God. I am the righteousness of God. Would you say it with me? I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. We say it to calm our fears when life feels uncertain and frightening and there are pandemics and wars and rumors of war and it swirls and strikes at the serenity of our souls. I am the righteousness of Christ. I cannot be condemned. I cannot be plucked from his hand. Jehovah said a canoe. I am the righteousness of Christ. The Lord's in my righteousness. Say it. Say it when, when you feel like you don't deserve his blessings. I'm talking about in the day by day, in the job interview, when the cancer scan comes back, when you feel inadequate, when the mountain seems too high. That's when you need to say, I'm the righteousness of God in Jesus Christ. Jehovah said we say it when the world condemns. We say it when the one that loves us initially then rejects us. We wonder if there's anything about us that's likable, acceptable at all. And then we realize if I'm the righteousness of Christ, then God not only loves me, but he likes me. And he not only forgives, but he restores. Rejected by the world, but accepted by Christ. We call him by his name. The Lord is our righteousness. We say it when we face the mountain and we're looking for faith and how could I believe that God would welcome me into the throne room and hear my plea? How could I come into the holiest place? What right do I have to come into the holy of holies and meet with the living God about my dilemma? I have it not in myself. I have it in Christ, my righteousness, the Lord, my righteousness. We say it when the powers of darkness mock and shame and remind us of our shadows and our shortcomings and our past failings and that whisper, that dark whisper that says, you do not measure up, you aren't worthy to be blessed. And we say, indeed, I am not except for this. Jehovah said, the Lord is my righteousness. And we say it when we feel the pressure of life to do more and be more and be perfect and please everybody to the point of feeling the crush of the world and so heavily laden and so guilty over all that we can't seem to be doing or getting done. And that's when we need most to say, the Lord is my righteousness. And we say it when we face temptation. Oh, beloved, call it out when you face, when you're at your darkest hour of temptation and you feel the pull of hate or lust or covetousness, that's when you most need to say, here's who I really am. I am made for more than this. I am set apart to God. I have been made holy. I am the righteousness of the Lord. You say it when you rise. You say it when you lie down. You sing it and you pray it and you praise it now and forevermore. Again, Charles Spurgeon's words, not Adam when he walked in Eden's bowers was more accepted than you are. I have read this 20 times this week and I can't get through it without tears. Not more pleasing to the eye of the all judging, the sin hating God then you are, if clothed in Jesus' righteousness and sprinkled with his blood. You have a better righteousness than Adam had. He had a human righteousness, and your garments are divine. He had a robe complete, it is true, but the earth had woven it. You have a garment as complete, but heaven has made it for you to wear. Go up and down in the strength of this great truth and boast exceedingly and glory in your God and let this be on the top and summit of your heart and soul. Jehovah, the Lord, our righteousness. You have something better than Adam had. You have something better than the angels and the archangels. You, you have something that, that the the cherubim stoop and long to look into and wish they had. You have been merited by the very righteousness of the sinless, perfect Son of God. So when God sees you, if you're a believer, he not only doesn't see your sin, but he sees all the good 
that he sees in his only begotten son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And if God sees you like that, what good thing would he ever withhold? You, Christian, are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That's the prophecy of Jeremiah, and that's the gospel. And all the poor and powerless And all the lost and lonely And all the thieves who come confess And know that you are holy, yes Lord And know that you are holy And all will sing out hallelujah, and we will cry out hallelujah. And all the hearts you are content, and all the feel
<laughs> Sometimes you don't want it to stop. Just keep going in. You know, just let the gospel just keep going in and going in. It's just so wonderful. See, see what, what Jeremiah was, was saying, the word of the Lord, was you had, you had the wrong king. And, and, and though it offends modern sensibilities, the life of the people was tied up with the king. If he was, if he was erring, then the people were. They were too wed. And so it's like a shepherd with sheep. You take the shepherd as a bad shepherd and the sheep scatter, they're afraid. They're... So what God said I need to do is I need to send a better king. And so he came himself to be 100% human and to represent you and me on the cross. Human being was on that cross, but he was God. And he was perfectly righteous. And he became your sin. So don't, don't let the devil ever tell you that you got one dab of that sin still on you. You honor Christ by letting him be your sin. And then you dare to believe what clearly the scripture teaches over and over that when you trust in him you're not only forgiven but you're credited with his righteousness and that changes everything it changes how you think changes how you feel changes how you praise changes how you do spiritual warfare changes how you live triumphantly in this world it changes your faith changes how you look at life it changes everything Hope you'll hang out for a cup of coffee or go by the prayer table again. Um, these Thursday nights are wonderful and I love being with you. I uh, hope you'll keep telling everybody that you know about it. Um, we're gonna be here. We might as well bless as many people as we can and it's a wonderful joy being here uh, with you. you. You who are clothed with the righteousness of God. Uh, may the Lord God bless you and keep you and be kind and gracious to you and make his face to shine upon you and give you his peace today and forevermore. Amen and amen.